Clarins is a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences and is majoring in International Studies with a minor in Latin American Studies. He's a proud member of the BC Acoustics a cappella group and is founding the Young Democratic Socialists of Boston College. Josh has an unhealthy relationship to Apples and is likely going to start Apples Anonymous, a Boston college for anyone who finds themselves in the same dire situation. <laughs> So um, if the slide doesn't tell you, uh, I studied abroad in Cuba last semester. Uh, and it's funny, one of the first questions people ask me is, why did I choose Cuba? Well, looking back, uh, I realized I wanted to run away from everything, you know? I wanted a total break from everything I knew. A new language, a new culture, a new chance to start over for a couple months and dive into a country that I knew almost nothing about and where I knew absolutely no one. A fresh start. I learned, though, that whenever you travel, you carry baggage. It turned out my time in Cuba wasn't so much a fresh start as it was a lesson about my past. Well, not my past exactly, but our past. The past of us all here in this room today. Because whether we like it or not, the fact that we live in America ties us into a complex history that surges into our present moment. A storied past that is the foundation of our modern world for better and for worse. Nowhere is America's complicated and contradictory history more present than in the island 90 miles from our southern shore, Cuba. Even though the US is extremely close uh, to Cuba geographically, we don't hear a whole lot about Cuba, either in our media or our history classes. The few times we do, in fact, talk about Cuba, there are two mainstream narratives. The first is the more conservative one characterized by the likes of George Bush and Marco Rubio, the idea that Cuba is a backwards island, ruled with an iron fist by a communist dictator who oppresses a starving people. An anachronism in our post-Cold World War um, era, a society plagued by economic stagnation and human rights abuses, a prison disguised as a country. The second narrative is the one peddled by the small but growing uh, Cuban tourism industry and curious liberals. This one mostly ignores Cuba's political situation situation and instead sees the island as a quaint country, frozen in time with colorful old cars slowly driving down the Malecon. Beautiful women peddling trinkets in the ocean breeze, wrinkled revolutionaries puffing at cigars, sharing old war stories. To travel to Cuba is to go into the past. Well, spoiler alert, both of these narratives are only fragments of the truth. Shadows of a reality that's impossible to see unless you live and breathe Cuba in its totality. Now, I'm not coming here to today to suggest that I understand the true Cuba. Far from it. The one thing that I did learn in Cuba is that I don't understand Cuba. That we as a country don't understand Cuba. These simplistic narratives that we tell ourselves are the baggage that we don't realize we're carrying. The lens we don't realize we're looking through. I'm not here to tell you the Cuban reality, merely to show that the reality we think we know is only a shadow. I arrived in Havana in August of last year, and as I was driving from the airport to meet my host family, I found out that one stereotype about Cuba is correct. There are old cars everywhere. More than half the cars driving down the street on any given street are American classics from the 50s, often braided, br painted in bright colors and spewing out doubt, dark clouds of exhaust. Here's actually the first picture I took while in Cuba. Uh, from inside an old Chevy, I snapped a pic of another Chevy. And at the time, I thought it was this rare moment that I captured on film, but it turns out it's a very, very day-to-day um, -day occurrence. These cars aren't collector's items used to wow tourists. They're the lifeblood of Cuba's transport system. Cars are passed down from father to son and are invaluable assets because they're one of the best ways to make a living. The US embargo that's been imposed on the island since 1963 has all but stopped the import of new cars to Cuba. So that's why these beautiful behemoths keep driving. There's no ability to replace them when they break down, so generations of mechanics have repaired and refurbished these cars over and over and over again. Old cars are an imposed reality, not, not a chosen one. So the stereotypes of a Cuba filled with old cars is true, in a sense, but it has a deeper layer that we don't recognize. But this realization about old cars, along with many others, didn't come until after I had left Cuba and had time to reflect. 
Honestly, the four months flew by in a flash of classes, long conversations with my host family and friends, trying and mostly failing to dance salsa, drinking mojitos, smoking a few cigars, and just living life. Life is slower down there. Everyone's much more intentional about relationships and making plans and enjoying the small moments. There isn't an incessant rush onto the next item in the calendar like there is here. And yet, Cuba isn't just a quaint country frozen in time like we so often hear. It's a modern society filled with people love, who love to take selfies, who dance to Rihanna and Drake on the weekends. So it wasn't this crazy country outside my norm, but I started to feel like I was getting that feeling that I was originally seeking, that I was losing myself in a new language and culture and country, that I was given a fresh start. Well, I couldn't see the baggage that I was carrying. That all changed when Fidel Castro died. November 25th, 2016. It was a Saturday morning and I rolled out of bed to find my host sister, Leslie, aghast in front of the TV. I asked her what was wrong and she just pointed. The news anchors that usually reported the news with chipper faces were solemn as the rolling banner uh, below them said, El Comandante Murió. The commander has died. El Comandante is a special nickname reserved only for Fidel. And over the next nine days of national mourning, I came to learn the depth of the adoration many Cuban people have for their leader of more than five decades. Um, these are my host parents, Kiki and Lesbia. Um, they weren't at the house, in the house at the time. They would actually left to go console their parents uh, as soon as they heard the news. Uh, Kiki's father had fought alongside Fidel in the revolution back in the 50s, and my host parents were worried that the news of Fidel's death would crush him. I think the truth is that Kiki and Lesbia needed the support of their parents, too. Indeed, Kiki and Lesbia met because Kiki was the commander of a woman's army battalion and fell in love with Lesbia, who was one of his soldiers. <laughs> Two star-crossed revolutionaries, a classic Cuban love story. When my host parents got back the next day, I asked them about Fidel and what he meant to them. They replied, El significa todo. He means everything. They meant what they said. I describe Kiki and Lesbia's lives as the Cuban dream, if you may. Lesbia's aunt was actually a maid for a rich family of lawyers before the revolution. When the rich lawyers fled following the success of the revolution, uh, Lesbia's aunt got to keep the house, from maid to homeowner in a flash, a status that she got to bestow on Kiki and Lesbia. They went to college for free and sent their daughter Leslie to college for free as well. Kiki and Lesbia have access to world-class doctors at no cost in medicine for a sliver of the cost that we pay here. The thing is, though, my host family story may be common, but it doesn't tell the whole truth. They are extremely lucky that they're able to rent out their house to tourists and students like me, essentially making what most Cubans make in a month every single night. Kiki has a position in the government, and so he has internet access in the house, an extreme rarity in the country with the most expensive internet access in the world. My host family is in the Cuban middle class and has benefited greatly from Fidel's revolution. <laughs> As such, they actually have two giant pictures of Fidel on their wall. Um, they aren't required to put them up, but I cho they chose to anyway. Here's actually a picture of one of the portraits. Um, I wasn't kidding, it is huge, and it's in the prominent uh, position in the house. The very next day, there was a huge memorial in the center of Havana um, after Fidel's death. My host parents asked if I wanted to go, and I figured why not? It seemed like a huge historical opportunity, even if I wasn't positive where I stood on the issue of Fidel's legacy. We left the house at 6.30 in the morning because my host parents wanted to be there as soon as possible. We waited in line for five and a half hours. The line stretched for blocks down the main avenue. Thousands upon thousands came out for the memorial, and nearly every face that walked out of the memorial was filled with tears. Walking around Havana for the next week was suddenly very eerie. Instead of the vibrant atmosphere filled with reggaeton music and loud Spanish phrases, the streets were silent. These nine days of mourning showed me the depth of the adoration the Cuban people had for Fidel. Many Cubans had the same answer my host family did to the question, what does Fidel mean for you? Significa todo. Yet there was this profound dissonance um, from what I was experiencing in Cuba and what I was hearing back home in the US. Whenever I'd check American news sites or open up my Facebook timeline, I'd see jubilance. People saying, ding dong, the witch is dead. When I shared the info that most Cubans were genuinely sad about Fidel's death, my friends were shocked. 
All of us Americans grow up with the narrative that Fidel is a monster who is hated by his people. It's a narrative that's subtly taught to us through short, one-sided history lessons or news stories that focus solely on the negative anecdotes from Cuba. And we don't know anything outside of this narrative. But the truth is that America, in many senses, created the phenomenon of Fidel. In order to understand this, we need to go back to what we call the Spanish-American War at the turn of the century. The name, the Spanish-American War, alone shows us that something is very, very wrong with how we teach history, because it was a war fought between Cuba and Spain um, that America entered at the very last uh, moments of the war to ensure that Cuba would remain under the thumb of American businesses. After the war, America uh, forced a newly independent Cuba to add the Platt Amendment onto their new constitution. Um, and the Platt Amendment said that the U.S. could intervene any time that Cuba passed legislation that went against U.S. interests. Um, so instead of spreading democracy, we were spreading the American empire. For the next five decades, the U.S. continued to meddle in Cuban affairs as Cuba went from democratically elected governments to dictators and then back again, often with a tacit support of the U.S. government. By the end of the 50s, the U.S. owned a majority of the sugar production in Cuba, its main export, as well as the telecommunications industry. Wealthy Americans used Havana as their playground to gamble, sleep with underage Cuban prostitutes, and go on drunken rampages. American mafia men started many of the hotels you can see in Havana today during this time of hedonism and gluttony. In fact, Cuba was the largest exporter of Cadillacs per capita uh, in the world, despite having thousands starve every single year. Cuba was an island divided between a small group of wealthy elites tied to American business and then everyone else. Well, Fidel and his band of revolutionaries set out to change this unequal reality. Starting with only 19 soldiers, Fidel read, um, led a guerrilla war that toppled the U.S.-backed di dictatorship of Batista in 1959. Initially a part of a moderate uh, coalition government, Fidel enacted a series of political moves that consolidated power in the hands of him and his radical friends. I interestingly, though, the revolution didn't start out as a communist revolution. It, it was only declared a communist revolution after the American invasion um, at the Bay of Pigs um, that Fidel announced that Cuba was going in a socialist direction um, aligned with the Soviet Union. So in many ways, America actually pushed Cuba to the Soviets, um, not the other way around. Again, with the old cars, the alliance with the Soviet Union was an imposed reality, not necessarily a chosen one. This is because while Fidel was certainly a communist, he was a Cuban nationalist, first and foremost. He saw the fundamental Cuban struggle as resisting foreign uh, imperialism, that the common denominator for nearly all of Cuba's poverty and um, illiteracy was the legacy left by Spanish and American colonialism. With Fidel's victory came a mounting of promises, like making Cuba a self-sustaining nation, creating a democratic government, crafting a national health care system, and resisting foreign influence. For some people, like my host family, uh, Fidel's policies lifted them out of abject poverty and into a comfortable life. Well, for many others who were imprisoned, beaten, and exiled because they were labeled as counter-revolutionary, Fidel became a tyrant who was destroying their country with an iron fist and a trail of broken promises. In the U.S., we almost exclusively hear the stories of those exiled from the country, as the vast majority of the Cuban exiles actually ended up in Miami. The hardline anti-Castro lobby is actually one of the most powerful interest groups um, in a, the American political system, donating millions of dollars in campaign funds to various politicians from both parties. Since nearly two million Cubans live in the crucial swing state of Florida, it's nearly impossible to find anything outside of the hardline anti-Castro narrative in the American political discourse. This refusal to see anything outside of the idea of Fidel as a ruthless madman is ignorant and speaks more to America's hubris than it does speak to about the Cuban reality. Um, because as I've shared, Fidel is as much a reaction to American imperialism as anything else. We should never ever discount or downplay the stories of these Cuban, brave Cuban exiles, but we should also recognize the larger story at play. When we endlessly decry the Cuban government for arbitrary imprisonment of political dissidents and other human rights abuses, we ignore the fact that we arbitrarily keep people that have never been convicted of a crime on Cuban soil in Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay. When we call the Cuban economic system a failure, we ignore the fact that every single Cuban has access to world-class medical care at little cost, while thousands of Americans die because they can't afford to go to the doctor. 
In fact, the childhood mortality rate is higher in the US than it is in Cuba. Like always, the truth is messier than we want to admit. One day, I was on a walk with Kiki when we saw someone carrying a bag of potatoes. Kiki quickly rushed over and asked the man where he got the potatoes, since potatoes are hard to come by in Cuba. We practically ran over to the market where they were selling potatoes, and we, we waited for 30 minutes in the line, where we were only allowed to buy two bags each. On the way home, Kiki remarked how quick the whole process had been, that he usually has to wait hours for potatoes, as long, um, along with lots of other hard-to-get foods. Now, on the surface, this seems to be a story about the inherent inefficiencies of the Cuban economy. And yet, the reality is much more complex. The US embargo of Cuba is extremely debilitating, since Cuba cannot trade with the largest economy in the world, in the US, and needs to import commodities from much further away, making costs rise, as well as limiting the possibilities of what to get. Many of Cuba's economic woes can be traced back to the embargo, what the Cubans call el bloqueo. There was this one time I was buying a card for my Cuban cell phone, and the receptionist helping me was taking forever because the computer just simply wasn't working. She looked up to me with a, small, with a sly smile and said, El bloqueo, que se puede hacer? The embargo, what can you do? This was obviously a joke, but like many jokes, it told a deeper truth, um, that Cubans see the embargo as the root of most of their problems. The thing is, this too is also a lie. Cuba's economic system is very inefficient. I heard many anecdotes, like the one where state-run companies would be so overstaffed that you would need four people to help you buy a toaster. One to open the door, one to take your order, one to grab the toaster, and then one to handle your money. Um, this is slowly changing as Cuba um, transitions to a market-driven economy, but inefficiencies are still everywhere. I think the truth of Fidel and his revolution goes back to the stereotype of the old cars in Cuba. Just like it's true that old cars are everywhere in Cuba, the stereotype of Fidel as a brutal tech di dictator in many senses is true. He is. But there's a deeper, messier truth that we ignore when we stop our analysis there. A lack of self-awareness about the messiness of our own political system and history in relation to Cuba. Those nine days of mourning following Fidel's death were instituted by the government and imposed uh, upon the people along with the propaganda that lines the streets of Cuba like this um, like this billboard. So you could say that people's genuine sadness at Fidel's death was the result of brainwashing. But you can say this only if you look critically um, back at our own country as well, at practices like the Pledge of Allegiance and the narrative of, of American exceptionalism um, in our history classes. Our own national pride is imposed upon us in such a totality that we cannot see it because we are constantly surrounded by it immersed in a patriotic fervor so much that it consumes us and spits out patriotic, non-critical citizens blind to the true footprint of the American empire. At the heart of the dissonance between the American and Cuban narratives about Fidel is the undeniable fact that nations need myths in order to exist. Governments are created and legitimized through violence, and so we need myths in order to explain the oppression inherent in hierarchical government systems. It just so happens that America and Cuba are two societies that blame their own injustices on each other, and the vast majority of us citizens are caught in the middle, blinded by power politics to see the other society as a great evil when we are both suffering as a result of the failures of our own governments. We let these national myths distract us from the injustices at home. If we get caught up in national myths, in believing the shadows of truths and denying the baggage we all carry, we are blind to the messy human reality happening all around us all the time and are bound to repeat the same mistakes made in the past. I didn't get a fresh start in Cuba like I wanted because we never get fresh starts. It's a lie to think we can. All of us are always products of our environments, our histories, and so we always end up carrying the baggage of our families and societies forward. If we were to improve this world, to set down our baggage, if we are to pre prevent dictators and empires alike, we cannot allow myths to swallow us. We need to face the truth in all its contradictory and messy reality. Thank you.